All right, we're back again with another big project. And as the title just said, this is a sequel of sorts to the incredibly important to me project, the Elithium Elith Um made from, well, scratch, basically. And it's the same this time. There's no references, there's no pictures to look after. This is just me purely figuring out how I want this to look and just making up the terrain and the background and pretty much everything as I go. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the actual um, centerpiece of this project, let's talk about the, I guess, the process here. What you're seeing is me just figuring out how I want the composition to look. So my framing, as I always talk about, uh, is what I'm making up here. Just some very rough outlines and some um, proportions of about what I want, some depth scaling, some color coding, just a really quick look at how I want things to look and how I want them to be framed. So that circle is going to be important later, but for now it's just a framing device that I use to see what's going to fit and what's not. So having decided that this is the composition is that I want to use, I'm now starting to go a little bit more in depth about how I want the terrain to look. I'm trying a couple of new techniques this time around uh, some stuff that I haven't done before, at least in public projects, um, in terms of the tools that I'm using this time around. So one of the new things that I'll be using a lot is the interpolate, not the uh, live path effect interpolate, but uh, if you're very quick there, you can tell I'm using the extensions version, which is uh, a bit more robust and a bit more intuitive, to be, to be honest. Um, so I'm using that to blend the terrain together to give it the depth that it needs and the sort of overall feel that I want. And uh, I mean, that's the easy part, right? Just figuring out the ground. But um, it really helped me instead of having to do a mesh gradient or like a um, like a linear gradient, because the interpolation tool allows me to make some more nuanced shapes and different compositions of shapes. So it's not just one linear gradient. It's almost like a mesh gradient, but without all the hassle of actually making a dozen different points and having them be different values and blending it together to go from bright to dark. So it's just a quick way of, of doing that with the interpolate tool instead. Now, moving on to the main component of this uh, is um, me trying to figure out how I want the trees to look. So I have a basic shape there that I'm trying to loosely follow. And the first step I did was make the tree trunk. Now, the tree trunk itself is not important. Uh, what's important is I wanted to try and make this sort of realistic looking and I leaned, I mean, it's no secret, but I leaned pretty heavily on uh, a tutorial made by Iron Echo Design for this particular workflow with the leaves where um, you take a bunch of different shapes and then you use the spray tool to sort of give it an organic feel by overlaying a bunch of stuff on top of each other. So that's the basic workflow. And I tried out a lot of different variations for this, um, which is why this took so long. So what you're seeing is uh, right now, I'm using the, um, the freehand tool with a preset of a live path effect where I basically just take a power stroke, thick in one end and zero width in the other end and just drawing freely with that to give it sort of a branch look without too much um, intervention on my part is pretty basic. And you know, the tree trunk like this is not pretty by any means, but it does um, it does help a bit when you get the more organic shapes in order and to get a bunch of uh, get a bunch of leaves on it. 
Now the, the particular shape, shape of the trees is heavily inspired by the, um, the African savanna. Um, and if you know where this scene takes place, it'll make sense why it's not exactly Africa, but the acacia trees and their overall sort of lean and the flat treetops and stuff is pretty much taken uh, with inspiration from that. So that's why they have this sort of flat look about them. I'm trying to emulate a, an African savanna even though it's not strictly speaking Africa. Um, now at this point, I'm starting to check out because even though it might look good, once it turns nighttime, it's way too bright. So I try to tone down the colors a lot um, because I don't want the trees to stick out like a sore thumb by being too, uh, too bright because this is going to be a nighttime, uh, nighttime scene. So I need them to be pretty dark. And so you can see I'm actually darkening the, uh, the foreground there. It was way too bright. And adding in some more dark shapes and uh, some other small details there. Now the, uh, the tool for this is something I've used before. It's the spray tool. Um, there's a lot of very decent tutorials online if you want to know more about this tool and the very important different uh, modes that you can have it in. I didn't get too much into it here at first um, because it's not strictly speaking important but um, if you want to do stuff like this then mastering the, um, the spray tool is a great way to go about it. Now, this little thing here is the actual seed of the tree. It's a capsule um, and I tried to do this in a few different ways. First off, I just tried to make it using a couple of basic shapes and some gradients, but I didn't really get the, the like round organic feel that I needed. Uh, it looked too clunky, too um, chunky. It didn't look like something that could roll so instead, what I ended up doing, as you can see there, is I took a couple of basic shapes again, but instead of doing it with gradients, I just made it bigger and interpolated a bunch of uh, a bunch of shapes to get that same feel of a different gradient, different colors, but actually meshing them together in a way that makes it look like one organic, complete entity. So that worked way better and that is my I guess master copy of the uh, capsule and I'm just gonna plop those every which way um, to sort of just hint that they're there bury them deep inside the um, the leaves and the branches just sort of sticking out sometimes uh, just to sort of hint that they're there and I'm just keeping all my assets off to the side. That's pretty standard for my workflow. If I have some assets that I want to keep or reference, I just bunch them up somewhere and then just, you know, basically grow out my, uh, my workflow around the centerpiece that I'm actually using. So keeping backups, making references and other sorts of uh, assets, I'm just going to stick around the uh, the centerpiece with no no clear or sight. So at this point, tree number two, I've got a sort of better idea of the workflow that I want to do. And instead of doing the same thing I did the first time, instead I'm making a base shape and then I'm actually looking into trying to do some basic um, basic effects using the filters instead. So even though this gives a great baseline, I'm still trying to figure out how I can make it a bit more organic. And filters offer some ways of doing that as well. Um, and you'll see that in a moment.
because it, the filters actually has a leaves option. It's not particularly amazing, um, but it did give me that rugged outline, random organic shape that I sort of wanted as my baseline. And it was a lot quicker to just have the filter make that for me instead of just going about it myself. So it's not meant to be the actual leaf texture, it's just meant to be something that breaks up the flow and gives it a sort of organic, uneven, greeny look. And then I'm just using that as a base shape, building the small um, different objects on top of it until I get something that's um, appropriately detailed and looks like, basically looks like a tree. So now one of the quirks of filters is that they have a seed which changes depending on um, your position. So as you can tell there, when, when I zoom in or out or when I reposition the tree, it tends to sort of shake up the seed a bit and uh, make it will change shape basically until you lock it in by doing some scaling just like it does for the um, watercolor effect. I don't know why it does this. It might be a bug or it might be, my personal theory is that it's based on, uh, the random seed is based on the X and Y coordinate of the center point. And so when you change the placement of the object, you change the seed accordingly, um, which might work as well as any other theory. I don't know. But basically the second tree is done and it looks, better than the first one and it was faster and more reproducible to do so this is the basic workflow that i've continued on with for the third tree make the trunk basic shape dark colors make a background canopy of leaves make that into a leaf filter work with the different options until i get something that's appropriately organic and you know non-uniform and then once I have that basic shape, I can build off of it by just applying the other smaller objects and basically make it a bit more detailed. Starting off with the branches, just a bunch of freehand with the, the power stroke applied to make it, uh, you know, thin out. And then I'm uni unionizing the whole tree trunk into one thing adding some very basic shapes to just sort of break up the flatness of the tree trunk and then adding a bunch of uh, <laughs> a bunch of these um, capsules and then I'm just using some basic orientations to sort of make them not look alike and then spraying on some different tree elements there on top so that works out pretty pretty fairly um it looks good enough for my intentions and and the purposes of this uh, this project and for the other trees in the background there i did a sort of speed workflow where i just because i don't need those to be as detailed so i'm just doing them all at once um adding the basic shapes i'm not bothering with the textures and the filters here for the tree chops because I know for a fact that the filter is too rough and too um, it's too upscale to work on such small targets. It would just be one big blob. Um, the thing about filters in general is that the kernels that you use to make them, the, uh, the, the actual things that generate the different effects, they tend to be very big. And so you can never get a good result, at least in my opinion, you can never get a good result from a filter by using it on a small object. Like small objects that you apply filters to, it'll just either disappear or just be one misshapen blob of rough unevenness that doesn't look anything like what you expected it to. So the bigger the object, the better filters are made to work with it. So. In this case, I didn't even try to bother with the uh, leaves effect. I'm just, it's just fine for me, for the trees in the background to just be more dense and less detailed. Now applying some more of those small thingies. 
And I don't need a ton of them. I just need enough to show that they're there. And then just cover it up with some more. You can tell that I just tried to use the leaves. And it just it doesn't it doesn't work. It's too uh, it's too small and it's too uncontrollable. So I am using a scaled down version of the same shapes that I'm using for the spray tool. They work just fine. And then it's just a matter of laying it in the right order so that you know the trees look like they actually have different depths. And now just at a glance it looks pretty good and at this point I'm just removing the old references and making some of the trunks darker to just make it look like it's actually there because it's a bit bright still And then I'm just applying some shadows just to give it a sort of more real feel instead of just plucking them down into nothing. I'm not going too much into detail about this. I just made a basic random shape and then just applied some different colorings to and different transparencies to give it the sort of feel that I felt like it looked. So not, nothing too fancy, just something that anchors it a bit. Now I don't know if there's anything else to really say here, it's just me still figuring out how I want the trees to look and I'm playing around with the colors and the darkness a bit to sort of make them a bit less standouty uh, because they really do look bright when they're supposed to be pretty dark, it's supposed to be pretty dark so, um, so I'm trying to tune them down a bit. Now for the little uh, settlement, shall we say, in the background there, I didn't really do much of anything with it. Um, it's just some huts, or at least whatever you might perceive to be huts in the background there, way, way back in the picture. And the only thing that I'm really trying to make look good is the actual fire. Now, as I said before, small objects that you apply filters to are not going to look good. So I scaled, you know, you saw that shape, I scaled up way up just to make a basic watercolor effect because if I tried to apply it on the small fire, it would just disappear completely. Um, so yes, I'm using some watercolors to give it a sort of more wild appearance, some more actual smoke and flames. And the rest of it is just a combination of three different uh, three different gradients applied on some basic shapes. So there's not a lot to it. I tried adding some more flames, but it didn't really look good. Uh, so I just kept it basic with a couple of couple of flames and uh, and just that smoke effect. So something like that might do. And then I made a smoke thingy just to sort of give it a, a bit of a presence. It's not meant to be noticeable, it's just meant as a small, small detail there, just, just a smidge in the darkness. Um, so that all worked pretty nice. And then I tried to apply some actual light to the camp, um, which I mean, it wasn't my best work, but it got the job done. So um, I won't say I'm happy with it, but I am content with the uh, with the effect. It looks okay. It looks all right. It does the job. And I briefly toyed with trying to make 
the huts be a bit more realistic in terms of where the lighting is coming from but i just decided that that detail was so minor that i didn't really i didn't even bother trying to really really do it because that would involve a bunch of mesh gradients um and some transparency overlays maybe some shadow work i didn't really want to get into that when you barely you can barely see it in the final picture so um no i, di I didn't really really try that um for reference if you are curious the uh, page i'm using as the border you can tell there's a, a bit of a golden yellow page border going through the whole thing that is a, an a4 template so that's for scaling um it's a, it's a size of an a4 page so you're not gonna see any detail work on the actual huts themselves so it doesn't really it doesn't really matter now onto the background there i just made a rectangle and then i just made a blue dark dark blue background because it is night time uh, but just a hint, just a small hint of some uh, some blue sky there on the very bottom right. Uh, other than that, I'm just going to see if I can apply some stars. Now stars, I've done that before. It's a pretty basic uh, idea. You just take a bunch of stars, make them randomized, make them really small, and then just use the spray tool. And then once you're done, um make sure that they don't stand out too much you can use a transparency filter or you can do some color work to just make them blend it a little bit more because if they look too bright they just look off um, you don't want them too bright um, so that was the that was the stars basically just the the backdrop for the whole project and now I'm once again trying to make the foreground a bit darker because it still stands out pretty much. But with that done, let's move on to the text. Now there is not a lot of text in this project. There is in fact only four letters. Um, but those four letters, well, they took a while to make because the main piece of this, if you looked at the thumbnail, you probably already know, and if you know, where this project is from like what inspired this project then you probably also know what's going to happen and and if you actually read the words that i just spelled out there then you also 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 know what's going to happen but um it had to happen and it had to happen this way at least that's what i thought um i ended up actually doing a bunch of off-camera work as well to try and get the technique just right for this um so what you're seeing there is the basic shape of what I'm going to apply all over the place. Um, it's a small, finicky, thin, almost like a comet-like shape with a very long tail, a very thin presence and just not very noticeable at all. That is until you apply it all over the place. Now at this point, it's no secret that this is another one of the tutorials that uh, Iron Echo Design made. So this is heavily inspired by that. But at the same time, that said, once I actually got into the process of doing this, uh, it turned out that his technique was not the most useful for this kind of work. So while it was the inspiration point, and I still learned a bunch that I'm using here, the actual technique he shows for this kind of work is not the technique I ended up using. I had to make up some other workflow for myself. And there's actually going to be a separate video on that. Because whenever I find I need something and I can't find it on the internet, that means that no one else has done this. And that means that there is a niche for me to step in and actually make a tutorial on some technique that no one else has done before. And I love it. So I did the same thing when I did the glass dome effects. Um, a previous tutorial of mine where I needed some glass effects. And no one on the internet had done it. As far as I knew, I couldn't find anything. So I had to invent it or at least make it up myself. And afterwards, I made a tutorial about it. Because, well, I found a hole. I found a hole. So this is the same thing. Uh, after I'm done with this video... I'm going to sit down and make a 
complete tutorial for the workflow and the technique and the different tools and tricks that you can use to apply this yourself in a way that's way less uh, random than what I ended up doing because it took a while to figure this out. Um, the whole project is about six hours and I think a good two hours of that chunk time both on and off screen was me figuring out the best way to go about actually applying this effect the way that I needed. Um, because you can see here what I'm doing right now is I'm messing about with the uh, marker effects and I'm using an arrow here to just explain directionality and the directionality keeps going back to being oriented towards the center relative to the path it's on and that's not what I need. I need something that's completely um, indifferent to the actual path orientation and so these tests showed me that the way to go about it was not this way, uh, at least initially. So what you're seeing on screen is just me messing about with the different ways that I thought of doing the thing that I needed to do. And this right there, this is actually the effect that I was going for. So at this point, I've discovered one way to do it. Um, with just a bunch of nodes uh, and markers. So finally, after who knows how long, it was actually time to try and do this myself. Now, one mistake I learned, learned was that this is a project that requires a bunch of strokes, not paths, like I usually do. So um, I had to get rid of a bunch of stuff and do it again because everything appeared twice. Once you have a path, it has an inner and outer bounds, while a stroke has no thickness. And that lack of thickness is what I'm going to have to rely on to make this work. Otherwise, everything is going to appear like it's doubled. And if you want some more variety on what you're doing, then having more different Markers is the way to go about it because all markers share the same characteristics regardless of what object you apply it to. Which was a bit of a bitter pill to swallow at first, but uh, I learned to embrace it instead. Um, if everything you're seeing on screen right now is just a mix of confusion, that's sort of the point. In a way, I'm not uh, making these videos as a tutorial. I'm making them as a sort of documentary byproduct of just doing the project itself. So I'll have, as I said, a separate video on how I actually go about this with a reasonable pace and cutting off all of the bullshit and all of the failures basically that I did in this project, just giving you what works instead of showing you what didn't work. Um, so don't worry if you don't understand what's going on. It's just a bunch of markers. You can look it up. But I'm also going to make my own tutorial on this because the application that I'm using this for is a bit unique, I hope, um, making this sort of effect and making it actually work. So I'm still trying to figure out the best way to make the letter appear without it being completely opaque and... Um, and the big breakthrough only comes after I start to randomize the nodes. So it's going to be a little, it's, a, it's going to be a moment before I do that. There we go. Lego uses his big brain to actually make a teaching that works. And at this point, I'm just, you don't have to worry about what I'm writing there. That is the steps that I'm taking. Uh, I'm documenting those for the future so that when I make, well, the tutorial video, I'll know what to do and what not to do. So I was just writing down my process there to get the desired result that I want. And that works for all the basic individual strokes one by one. I'm pretty sure you could actually just, um, I'm pretty sure you could combine it all into one mess of strokes and just apply it all at once but i wanted it to be a bit individual i wanted it to be a bit random and make it um, not so uniform so 
This is why I applied it on each object by itself. Um, it also gives me a bit of a more control about how bright I want it to be. So I get the, um, the effect that I want. And believe it or not, this actually didn't kill my computer more than once. And that was sort of my own fault. Um, it looks crazy with the amount of objects that's going on here, but it's actually fairly simple in terms of how much is actually happening on screen. Um, each object only has about between 500 and 1500 nodes, which sounds like a lot, and it is, but at the same time, it's just a square, or sorry, a circle, it's just a path. There's no complex objects here. It's just a simple object with a lot of stops. So it's not computationally, computationally uh, hard to like render the object. It's just, it's just a circle with a bunch of extra nodes. Um, and each of the markers are actually, well, they're not actually strokes anymore. They're just, they're just markers. So they don't have all the extra nodes and all the individual uh, detail work that if you actually pasted that amount of individual objects, it would have. So the amount of objects on screen is actually way fewer than you would expect because all of the markers don't count as objects. And so they're not uh, nearly as computationally intensive to work out as it were. Now at this point, I'm looking at the stars and I'm going, they're too big. So I'm remaking the stars, but smaller because I don't want them to stand out that much. Um, now you can barely see them, but there's a lot more stars now, and it looks a bit more, it looks a bit more natural now, um, less crazy. So at this point, I'm adding the dots for the text because I need three dots, and I can't make them the same way I can with the solid objects because these dots don't have, by definition, any strokes. They wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't look good with strokes, and it wouldn't. It would kind of defeat my uh, my purpose there. So um, instead, I just made them semi semi solid and just applied some basic tails myself using a freehand tool. Now, with the text done, it's time to add the uh, other bits, so to speak. So I'm making a bunch of other random objects in the sky to sort of make the text not stand out a bit. I'm, I'm trying to blend the text in a bit among the other effects so that it looks more natural, less forced. So I'm just playing around with a bunch of stuff. Keen viewers will know that this piece I'm actually working on right now is made precisely after the instructions of Iron Echo Design. So it's not that I'm not using that technique as well, it's just that it didn't work out for my workflow when I'm actually writing text because the directionality of the thing can't work out the way it's meant to be. The, um, the stitch subpath effects won't work on paths of that nature. And I'll go into that more in the tutorial. I'll, and I'll also link below the original tutorials that I used as an offspring or as a springboard for this project so that is the tree tutorial and the um, the tutorial for the effects that you see on screen right now that's the iron echo design pieces that i did look at before trying my hand this and they're absolutely worth a look even though i did not end up using the techniques quite the way they showed it so at this point i'm pretty happy with this i've got a bunch of stuff going on in the sky and it looks really good. I've got an easy workflow. Uh, I'm pretty pretty happy with that. So um, it's just smooth sailing from here. <clears throat> Foreshadowing. Oh wait, actually, I edited the, I edited that out. Never mind. There there was one crash when I tried to uh, copy and paste the um, copy and paste the live effect. The live path can be copied and then applied to another object. But when you do things like this, 
which is a bit bigger than just say a bend effect, it's not going to work well when you try to paste it. So it uh, it is highly recommended that you apply any life path effects. If they're complex, do it by hand. You're going to save yourself a lot of time and headaches um, instead of trying to paste the effects onto other objects. If they're complex, just do it by hand. You're going to save yourself so much time. Even though it takes a few extra seconds to get the values inputted every time, it's still going to be a lot faster and a lot more controllable when you do it yourself. Now, one downside to using this technique is that you don't have a lot of control over the colors. Um, it's very hard to do a gradient on something that is so fluid and so organic. The only real option you have is a mesh gradient, and the nature of mesh gradients are not oriented towards this manner of usage. And by that I mean it's going to look too uniform no matter what you do. It's going to look too flat no matter what you do because the mesh gradient, I mean, you would need a ton of different nodes to make it organic enough to follow in that sort of workflow. And that is not ideal and it's not, it's not suitable for this piece and uh, for workflows in general to have to stop and do that many extra colorings. At that point, it's probably better to just apply an actual texture on top of it and hope that is uh, varied enough that it looks like it has different colors throughout. Because doing that by hand, especially on a mesh gradient, especially on something that's that fluid and thin, it's going to be, it's going to take you a while. So I didn't even try. Now darkening the ground once again because it was still too bright. Um, at this point I'm pretty happy with the sky and it's time to try and make the foreground a bit more interesting because while it is a savanna, it looks a bit barren right now. Um, so I tried to make up a bunch of different just sort of grass sections, small pieces of grass, some dirt, some uh, a bit of uh, some foliage. Um, made a bunch of those, grouped it together, then tried to spray those onto it. But as you'll see in a moment, it looks pretty bright, far too bright. Um, so I had to darken those a lot because they stood out way too much. And then I also made them a bit smaller. So spread them out a bit, made them take up a little more space, grouped them together, sprayed them again. And this looks a bit better. I mean, I'm not trying to make an actual like meadow uh, here or anything. I'm just trying to break up the terrain a little bit to just make it sort of not flat and boring. Um, but at the same time, I don't want the grass to stand out. So I'm actually doing a combination of the blurs. I'm blurring it. I'm making it halfway transparent. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm actually darkening it further by putting it below the dark, uh, the dark patch that I made on top. So it doesn't really stand out, but it is sort of like just something that breaks up the terrain a bit to make it less, uh, less monotonous. Now the big finishing piece, I really like this. The actual glass, spyglass, if you will, the uh, actual way of looking at this scenery. So I made a basic brown edge sort of thing. And then I just did a bunch of gradients and mesh gradients on the actual centerpiece, the glass, to give it that 3D effect. Now, as I said before, I've made a 3D glass dome tutorial, especially for this usage. So this is precisely why I made that tutorial. I'll have a link below but that uh, it is especially made to create things like this. So you're seeing it in effect here, basically. I'm using it to make some glares and making some uh, 
basically reflections to give it the look and feel of looking through an actual spyglass. Um, so that is that's precisely why I had I have that uh, tutorial because no one else on the internet had this. So I just I had to do it myself. And adding in all the stuff, I'm pretty much done with this, I think. Just adding some more grass to the bottom there. I raised the sky a bit, and there we go. That's it. Thanks for watching.